So next up we have uh, Detlef van Vuren. He's um, from the Dutch Environmental Protection Agency, PBL, and also a professor at uh, Utrecht. Um, many of you will know Detlef, certainly his name, and if you don't, you'll, everyone in this room will know RCP 2.6. That's Detlef. Um, Detlef is uh, quite a pivotal figure in the integrated assessment modeling community. He leads the, the image team. As I said, um, he was the one that did uh, put together RCP 2.6 originally. There was also some solid work done here at uh, Chalmers with Christian Azar on, on negative emissions around the same time. But uh, Detlef has been around from the start of the negative emissions discussions and I really look forward to your presentation and listening to what you've got to say. Thank you. So my microphone is on, yes. Um, Sabine just gave an excellent uh, overview of the literature on the negative emissions. And in my presentation, I will zoom in on a particular part of that literature, which is related to the modeling. And before doing so, I would like to say a few words about those models. And most of these models are uh, looking into mitigation. Uh, action and trying to ev evaluate different mitigation strategies. So let's assume for the moment that they are observed, uh, looking into the question of how to reach the Paris target. Uh, to how can we stay below, well below 2 degrees or even below 1.5 degrees. Uh, it's very clear that that question is very complex. Uh, there are inertia involved. Decisions today have a long in influence on the long-term future. There are multiple scales. Uh, we have re the, the scale of the, the grids, the cities, the sectors, the regions and the world. And they are all somehow are connected. Uh, decisions made in one region might impact cost of a certain technology and have influence on a second region. There is feedbacks. Uh, decisions, for instance, on how to use land has impact on land cost and therefore on the cost of other technologies. And there's uncertainty. Uh, that we don't know what's going to happen into the future. And that's where, why uh, model-based scenar uh, scenario analysis makes sense. As somehow we can not capture all of this with our own brains and models are tools to try and to uh, capture all these complexities. So this means that these tools are not meant to forecast. Uh, they are not uh, looking into 2050 and make a prediction, uh, but they somehow try to make a map of the current understanding of the system and to show the uh, uh, trade-offs, synergies, efforts that we will find uh, in reaching certain goals. And we can easily see that these models are not forecast if we just look at the performance of a model in the last five years on PV, for instance. Eh? For single technologies, uh, the performance of these models is, are simply limited. At the same time, they're still very interesting tools because they bring it together what, what we currently know of, of a topic. So how does the tools look like? Now, typically an integrated assessment model has a representation of the human system and of the Earth system and the interaction between them. And in the human system, most of these models look at two subsystems, which is the energy system and the land use system, and also on the connections between them, but this mostly via biofuels. And so using these tools for mitigation analysis means that we allow the model to choose certain technologies to have activities in both the energy system and the land use system, and that we somehow put a climate constraint on these activities. And so these activities lead to emissions, and we simply sum across all these, all these different technologies, and over time, and we have some kind of climate constraints, either temperature or a CO2 budget, for instance. And then, typically, these models work on a cost optimization regime. Uh, so while we have the climate uh, constraint, they also try to optimize the the minimize the cost. And so we know the cost of the different technologies. Uh, we uh, know, know them over time. There's a discount rate applied and then uh, cost optimization across the century or in, cer in certain years. 
Uh, and that means that in the model there is either a, a, car a shadow carbon price or a real carbon tax. And thus, if you want to ach achieve a certain target, the model starts to select and have a preference for low carbon options, uh, preferably even uh, zero carbon options. And if the price is high enough, negative carbon options. There are lots of other constraints in, 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 these, in these models. Um, uh, for instance, the fact that in the energy system, some of the uh, energy is consumed as electricity, uh, other parts are consumed as uh, heat, and so that means that the technologies cannot freely compete, they're competing in different sectors. So what kind of technologies are in these systems? Uh, so first of all, there are lots of normal mitigation technologies like energy efficiency, fuel substitution, renewables, CCS, reduction of non-CO2, and land-based mitigation. And then these models also look into uh, negative emissions. And of the negative emissions, mostly it's backs and afforestation or reforestation that is uh, looked into these models because they're relatively easy to compare on a cost optimization regime. Uh, other uh, technologies uh, are not captured so much into the literature. There are a few papers about them, uh, and that's direct air capture, uh, enhancing soil carbon or ocean visualization or any other technology that were, was in the previous uh, presentation. The amount of the, uh, literature in the modeling uh, world on this technology is much more limited. Yeah, like I said, partly because of uncertainty, partly because it doesn't fit so nicely into a uh, cost optimization evaluation. So one thing uh, before we continue is to realize how stringent uh, the climate targets are that we are uh, exp uh, imposing here. Uh, this is the working group, famous working group one chart where we have temperature on one axis, cumulative CO2 emissions on the other axis, and the relationship between them. Uh, if we want to evaluate um, how much carbon we still can emit for st staying within two degrees, uh, we can uh, put a line in this graph at two degrees, uh, and then calculate from different points in that graph uh, how much CO2, cumulative CO2, would correspond to the two degree target and then subtract the amount of CO2 that was already emitted historically, the gray bar, and then you get a carbon budget that is still available. Now that depends on where you would like to be in that uh, particular graph, if you want to take a high risk or a low risk, and also your assumptions on non-CO2. Uh, this was done in the AR5 AR report. It gave you basically around 800 kicketons of CO2 on average still left today to meet the two degree target and about around by four or five hundred, no, uh, sorry, about uh, 200 gigatons of CO2 still left uh, to meet the 1.5 degrees uh, target. Since AR5, new estimates have been published, sometimes revising these numbers a little bit upwards, um, but still in many cases, the basic story is uh, it's very constraining. And so let's take an average number like 1,000 gigatons of CO2. 1,000 gigatons of CO2, which is the two degree target, is really, really tight. Um, in an average business as usual scenario, you would easily admit 4,000 gigatons of CO2. I'm ma mapping here what the 1,000 gigatons of CO2 means. At the moment, our emissions are 40 gigatons of CO2, uh, so about uh, 20 times, uh, 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 25 times higher. So it means that if you want to go straight down, uh, you have about 40 to 50 years left linear, if you linearly go, do go down. If you do that from today onwards, you have to realize that most of our technologies have a lifetime of around 40 to 50 years. Uh, so uh, if we build a plant, it's about for, for that period. So if you want to achieve the target by following the middle scenario, it means that globally, around now, you have to build everything carbon-free. Not only in the US or in Europe, but also in Asia and in Africa. So, uh, clearly, if we give the models also the option of negative emissions, that middle scenario is not the favorite one. 
uh, it, it somehow would merge to the scenario on the right, where we gave the, the model the option to, for instance, create minus 250 gigatons of CO2 negatively uh, via BEX or afforestation. And so we can easily understand that that scenario, which still is, ha has a lot of mitigation going on, uh, but slightly slower in the beginning, is an attractive proposition. So if we start running the, scenario, the models, you can, you can see that they come up with, some, with a strategy that's quite similar. Uh, this is from the overview paper of Max Tavoni in 2015, where he looks into the two degree scenarios at the time, and he's showing that uh, all of them follow a strategy comparable to this. Uh, so they go down very rapidly, uh, around 2070 reach zero, and then goes, goes negative. So a strategy peak in around 2020, steep emission reductions, carbon neutrality around 2070, and then negative emissions. If we look at the literature, and this is AR5, uh, we see that about around 90% of the scenarios that are published at the time for two degrees use this strategy. Uh, and only about 10% 10, 10 of the scenarios that pub were published at that time had no net negative emissions. I don't think that it has changed. It might even be uh, higher by, na by now. There's, I, I'm not sure whether your evaluation looked into this, uh, but um, I think it's more or less still the same story. So if we start to uh, look a little bit deeper, and so this is still the same line. Eh? So we follow now the line down here, and we only look at the CO2 emissions. Um, so that's here, that's the net CO2 emissions. As Sabine and Fuchs just showed you, uh, actually if you unpack that, there are things happening behind there. There are the, C the fossil CO2 emissions, which are reduced rapidly, and then at some point hit the, those sectors that are difficult to uh, reduce, like for instance the CO2 emissions coming from aviation. We have the emissions from land use, uh, which uh, typically go down. And then we have the, the option to start compensating some of those sources via uh, negative emissions. Uh, and so this is actually from the image model, but you see uh, that it's implementing ne uh, uh, negative emissions already uh, starting around 2030 and then scaling up. And at some point it reaches the net negative emission point. The land use emissions actually in this particular run are not brought, uh, brought to zero around tw uh, before the mid-century. And the reason is actually because it's implementing so much bioenergy, uh, it's still uh, having a positive land use emission. If we uh, accumulate this over time, it looks something like this. Eh? So we have a thousand gigatons of positive CO2 emissions mostly from the sectors that are hardly to wait, but also partly as a result of inertia in reducing. And then that's compensated by 600 or 500 gigatons of net negative emissions, if you look over, the, uh, do the cumulative over time. And this is a typical, typical 1.5 degree scenario in the literature. This is actually the run that is done by Remind, uh, but um, it's not so very different from what other models would get. So enormous reliance uh, on neg negative emissions. Uh, they offset early emissions, but they also offset emissions in difficult sectors. And if you then start plotting all the models and look at the cumulative use of net negative emissions, here we have the radiative forcing targets uh, that were implemented by these models. Here you have the cumulative use of net negative emissions. 2.6 watts per square meter that's the two degree target, uh, 1.9 watts per square meter to com corresponds to the 1.5 degree target. And you see the tighter the climate target, the more the models rely on a cumulative use of net negative emissions. And while it was still around 100, 200 gigatons of net negative emissions for two degrees, for 1.5 degrees, the models would even use around 200 to 500 gigatons of CO2 net negative. So why don't the models to get this? 
under high carbon prices, uh, fossil CCS, but also bio CCS, are very competitive technologies. Yeah? And so, while also renewables provide are competitive, uh, once they you start to implement them heavily, they, the, their implementation comes, becomes constrained by the uh, high, at high penetration rates, and therefore also uh, CCS and, uh, is, is competitive. And negative emissions have the strength of the compensation, as I highlighted before. Uh, it can compensate earlier emissions, and it can compensate hard to reduce emission sectors. So coming back to the models, is there anything particular about the models that gets this result? Uh, maybe, there are, there are a few factors. I think the technical assumptions in the IAMs are quite reasonable. There have, there have been some uh, evaluations. Uh, uh, Nems Forgen has looked at this, uh, uh, Köbel has looked at this, and they conclude that the, uh, the, the assumptions in the IAMs technically and economically are quite consistent with the literature. Also, Köbel, Barbara Köbel showed that uh, the results are reasonably robust against parameter uncertainty. But you have to also admi uh, admit that the models formulate things in terms of cost optimization, which means that they don't really look into societal constraints deliberately. Yeah, they want to show what would come out under a certain uh, assumption. They also don't really take risk reduction as a starting point. Uh, you could, for instance, say, I don't want to have a risk with food competition and therefore start uh, running uh, scenarios mostly to avoid that particular problem. They can do so, but it's not uh, the typical run that they, uh, is published. And it's relatively difficult for models to evaluate other strategies than those that can easily be expressed in terms of cost. For instance, diet change is not something that is normally chosen in the scenario analysis, simply because it's more difficult to formulate it in terms of cost. So, having seen that this is a reasonable outcome under certain formulation of the problem, in, 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 in a very reasonable re uh, formulation of a problem, it does represent a, some issue. Uh, if we evaluate, start evaluating the literature, and 90% of the scenarios has a very high reliance on net negative emissions, it becomes a little bit difficult to start comparing the advantages of using a lot of net negative emissions and using much l less of that. And one example how things can go a little bit wrong is the, uh, the AR5 report. Uh, we, in the chapter six, we form formulated that if you want to achieve the two degree target, you uh, need to reduce emissions by 40 to 70% by the mid-century. This is influenced heavily by the fact that 90% of the scenarios we evaluated had net negative emissions. And you see that formulated clearly in chapter six. If we bring this into the summary, we have to write it more uh, succinctly. And so there it says 40 to 70 percent emission reduction and net negative by the end of the century. It doesn't say only if you achieve net negative emissions, the 40 to 70 percent is right. And so later on, I looked into this, and it's actually 40 to 60 percent if you have net negative emissions, but you would have to reduce greenhouse gases by 60 to 70 percent if you did not have net negative emissions. This is all greenhouse gases. For CO2, it would be even more than that. And, and so formulating it as 40 to 70 percent and then having uh, policymakers in, in, uh, interpreting that range as being 40 percent emission reduction um, forces us automatically as a society in a situation where we need to use at some point this net negative emissions. And, and so one consequence, and I'm not uh, being against net, net negative emissions at all, I think they are inevitable, but one consequence of evaluating them is that we also need to find language that uh, expresses our findings in the right way to policymakers. And there are disadvantages of net negative emissions, as highlighted in the literature. Uh, and uh, one of the most important ones for the BEX option that is evaluated heavily in our literature is uh, the land use, uh, as uh, emphasized by Sabine. Um, 
we need that land also for other societal problems like hunger, uh, reducing hunger or preserving biodiversity. The models take that into account uh, and they make estimates of reasonable yield increases, but they are not truth machines as I emphasized before. Uh, and so there might be a situation where yields don't go up as high uh, as fast as assumed in the models, which would bring you in a certain risk. The fact that the, uh, we are using a lot of biofuels in the case of scenarios with net negative emissions does not mean that we would not be using a lot of biofuels in scenarios without net negative emissions. And I would like to emphasize that in this chart, uh, the green lines are the scenarios with net ne negative emissions, the blue lines are the ones without net negative emissions. Here is the use of bioenergy with CCS, uh, but here is the use of bi uh, bioenergy without CCS. If we have the models running under a two degree constraint without net negative emissions as an option, they have to reduce the emissions in difficult sectors to zero, including aviation. And as a result, the bioenergy is actually going into those that difficult sectors. And so the amount of bioenergy uh, in scenarios where I don't allow BACs to be used is actually similar uh, as it is in the scenarios where I did not have that constraint. I want to again emphasize that bioenergy is not uh, unconstrained in these models. They simply model the land use and so they are aware of the competition for other f uh, with other sources. They model that, they take it into account, they can even run and they most of the time run uh, under the assumption that they uh, somehow also make sure that food is supplied to people. Uh, there are also sustainability constraints sometimes in taken into account in these model runs. Um, and so the amount of bioenergy that is often used in these scenarios is in the order of 150 uh, exajoule, but there is a range clearly to that. These are two models. This is the global model and image, uh, which mid-century uh, would use around 150 uh, exajoules of bioenergy. So they also model the consequence of using land. Eh? And so uh, if you use more land for bioenergy, it comes from something. And so this is accounted for, which could mean use of natural land, but it could also mean uh, pace of ag agriculture land. And there are excellent papers by Alex Pop that discuss this. So is it possible then to find scenarios with less use of bags? And I would like to emphasize at the end of my presentation two uh, papers that we have recently looked into this. One is by uh, Krikler, uh, Elmar Krikler, and he started off with this equation. Uh, so the sum of the CO2 emissions across the century is equal to uh, the amount of energy uh, used for, uh, uh, in terms of electricity times the emission factor for electricity plus the amount of energy we use in terms of heat times the uh, emission factor uh, for heat. And then he said, okay, let's make bold assumptions for each of these factors. And so here in black, he has made uh, four bold assumptions, uh, which is stable energy from now on, two scenarios where he actually reduces the final energy, one where there's a, a brief a small increase. The, the most bold scenario here reduces energy back to 200 exajoules, which is half uh, what we are currently using. It uh, increases the uh, energy intensity improvement over time to about three to 4% per year, while this is historically was about one to 2% per year globally. Uh, so this is a very bold assumption. For electrification, he also made some bold assumptions. Uh, we're currently here globally at around 20% of uh, global energy use being electricity. He uh, leads one of the scenarios up to 90% uh, being electricity, which is bold. Um, it's above the estimates, uh, high estimates made for Germany uh, at the moment uh, around mid-century. Then he made, uh, makes assumptions about the decarbonization rate. So for power, we have the advantage that there are lots of renewables available, 
So his bold assumption is by 2040, 2050, we have totally decarbonized the power sector. Then for all the other heat, um, he is a little bit less bold, rightly so, eh, because these are difficult to abate. And so he assumes that by around 2070, the most optimistic case, we have totally decarbonized it. Now, behind the black lines, you actually see the uh, 1.5 and 2 degree scenarios from the IAMs. Eh, and so in many cases, uh, the IAMs cover the range of these bold assumptions, but not always. Eh? So the IAMs are slightly higher in final energy use, and they are slightly slower uh, in the decarbonization of the other sectors. So maybe there's a little bit of uh, possibility to uh, be more optimistic there uh, as the IAMs are. Now I'm showing you uh, the... Is this the five-minute warning, uh, Glenn? Yeah, okay, perfect. So... Uh, the results of that. So if you run this equation, you get all these, uh, and you combine all these f uh, assumptions that uh, uh, Elmer made, you get all these black lines here. Uh, and so these are CO2 emission lines that he gets. This is the cumulative CO2 emissions. And again, he compares that in the blue lines with the two degree scenarios in the literature and the red lines, the 1.5 degree scenari uh, scenarios in the literature. And so these are, given the fact that probably some of the lowest scenario here is almost the lowest we can get to, this, uh, this is really the bottom end of CO the CO2 emissions that we can expect. And this is around 600 gigatons of CO2. And now remember that the carbon budget estimate from AR5 uh, for 1.5 degrees was 400 gigatons of CO2 of which we have used 200 gigatons of CO2. Uh, and so automatically it means that totally avoiding negative emissions is uh, for a 1.5 degree target impossible. Uh, unless we are lucky and the carbon budget would not be uh, the AR5 estimate, but uh, for instance uh, the 600 gigaton CO2 estimate uh, published uh, more recently. So that's what Elmer does in his paper in the end. He simply plots different carbon budgets, plots the cumulative emissions that he achieved um, uh, via these uh, ambitious scenarios, calculates the amount of CDR he needs by saying, OK, I have a carbon budget, I, I simply uh, subtract uh, the emissions coming from uh, the fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuels, and so this is the amount of CDR I need. And then he concludes that for any carbon budget below 650 gigatons of CO2, I need negative emissions. And for most of the scenarios, up to 1,200 gigatons of CO2, net, ne net, net negative emissions seem not uh, a, 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 an unlogical proposition. So then there is the other paper, which is uh, the paper published by our team where we uh, not only focused on the CO2 part of the story, but pretty much also on the land use and the non-CO2 part of the story. And because if we are able to reduce non-CO2 emissions more rapidly, we also make a lot of room for um, a little bit, more, for little bit more room for CO2 emissions and therefore avoid the need for negative emissions. And so we explored a, a lot of things that typically are not explored in the models because most of these are not easily be formulated in terms of a cost uh, scenario. And so if we, for instance, looked into a low population scenario and the possible impact of that on how much uh, neg ne negative emissions you uh, need. Or, for instance, on a low non-CO2 scenario where we um, assumed cultivated meat. But the scenario I want to focus on more mostly is the lifestyle change one where we assume that people would go to a healthy diet, not to a vegetarian diet, but simply to a diet that is consistent with the health recommendations, um, which, for instance, means uh, once every two weeks beef consumption. For um, pig and, pul uh, and poultry, it's much less restrictive, but for beef, it would go going back to once every two weeks. Um, but also, we assumed uh, the mobility to be changed to Japanese patterns. Uh, and um, 
And uh, for, for domestic appliances, we also assumed a reduction in their use. Now, what would be the result? So this is the default strategy that I uh, showed you earlier. This is the uh, integral over time uh, for the two degree scenario with the 1.5 degree scenario. So we have, again, the 1,000 gigatons of CO2 up to on the positive side being compensated by 500 gigatons of CO2 on the negative side, mostly backs, blue. And now we have the lifestyle change one. And, the, and what, the, what the scenario is able to do is to reduce the amount of backs that is needed by at, at least a factor of three up to a factor of four. And that's mostly because we have made a lot of land available via the diet change, and we also reduced the methane and the N2O emissions a lot, and therefore uh, also increased the carbon budget, and that you can see by the red dot, that's around four, uh, 400 gigatons here, it's about 600 gigatons here. And we also uh, had more room for afforestation as a result. And so we, in this paper we were able to show that the amount of net negative emissions is not given and that we are, there are options to reduce it. But reducing it to zero seemed to be really, really hard uh, because I just uh, integrated the assumptions that we did made in the lifestyle change scenario. They're not easy. Uh, they're, they're quite extreme as well. And so um, there are options out there, but it doesn't ma make the transition much easier. So some of the, so one thing that I really would like to argue is that an open discussion is needed. Uh, actually, it was also on the slides of Sabine. This is a paper that we published uh, last year. I think a bit of the discussion was a bit too implicit so far. Uh, I think we have to emphasize how important net negative emissions could be. At the same time, we also want to discuss maybe how we can uh, reduce our reliance, not bringing it to zero, but making it a little bit less, uh, so that we are uh, having a, a little bit less of a risk of trade-off with food. Interestingly, the 8 o'clock news last uh, Monday, uh, in response to a Shell uh, discussion, uh, had three minutes in the Netherlands on net negative emissions. Uh, and the 8 o'clock news is our big news item. So many scenarios have around 10 gigatons of CO2 backs, negative, net negative emissions uh, uh, included in most model outcomes, which has a consequence for the, um, the how we frame the reduction uh, uh, needs. Short-term reduction depend, uh, uh, targets depend on our assessment of the long term, which is difficult. It makes uh, it's a, di a difficult thing to discuss with policymakers. Without net negative emissions, stringent targets get more expensive uh, and in, in the case of delay, impossible to reach. And there are options to reduce net negative emissions. Thank you very much. <laughs>